Our second presenter this morning is Ernie Freeberg, professor and chair of the Department of History at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He happens to be a past lecturer at the Debs Museum, like I said, and his talk today is on Eugene V. Debs and the fight for free speech in World War I. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a, a really wonderful uh, opportunity to be here. I'm really delighted. So thank you for the invitation again. Yesterday we talked, uh, uh, sort of took a deep dive into the, the Cleveland uh, trial. Uh, today I want to do two things. One is to sort of step back and, and talk a bit about, as we've been, been talking about, what brought Debs uh, to the trial in Cleveland. But I think uh, as important to me is the story about how Debs got out of prison. We, we left him heading off to, to uh, a Supreme Court that would unanimously send him off to, to uh, the Atlanta Penitentiary for a decade, uh, but he was only in prison for three years. And, and I think that's an important and, and uh, less told part of this story that I'd like to share with you today. So on April 2nd, uh, 1917, Woodrow Wilson asked Congress for a war declaration promising the United States that they would enter the, the war for no selfish object, but to make the world safe for democracy. Two days later, uh, America's socialists gathered for an emergency meeting in St. Louis in order to denounce Wilson and to, and to refute his rhetoric. The socialists said this, they said, in all modern history, there has been no war more unjustifiable than the war which we're about to engage in. No greater dishonor has ever been forced upon a people than that which the capitalist class is forcing upon this nation against its will. And here's some of what the St. Louis platform uh, says. We brand the declaration of war by our government as a crime against the people of the United States and against the nations of the world. We pledge ourselves to the following course of action, continuous active and public opposition to the war through demonstrations, mass petitions, and all other means within our power, an unyielding opposition to all proposed legislation for military and industrial conscription. The socialists argued that this was a, a war between imperial powers that did not concern the United States. It was a war to protect J.P. Morgan's extensive loans to the Allies. And the socialists were not the only ones to argue that this would be uh, a war in which uh, the wealthy would get rich and the poor would be the ones who would be dying in the trenches of France. A rich man's war and a poor man's fight, as the saying goes. Now, the socialists were not alone in, in opposing the war. Many immigrants uh, were opposed to the war. There, uh, Wilson himself, uh, as uh, leading up to the war, called on Americans to be neutral because he was worried about the powder keg of a nation that was uh, one third either immigrants or children of immigrants. And there were a lot of divided loyalties. Of course, the, a very large German American population was conflicted about going to war against what they saw as the, their, their fatherland. Uh, Irish Americans uh, were not at all interested in doing anything that was gonna help out uh, the British at that point, and many Jewish immigrants were not interested in an alliance that at that point uh, included the Russian Tsar. But the socialists were really the most dangerous force at this moment, uh, the one that was best organized to actually uh, carry forth this opposition to the war. First, they had an, an enormously diverse and lively press uh, that reached millions of people. Uh, we talked a lot yesterday about the masses, the wonderful uh, uh, sort of high art version of, of this, this radical press, but, but there are also ones that reached a much bigger audience, including The Appeal to Reason. Upton Sinclair published his Jungle in, in a serial in The Appeal to Reason first. Uh, it, it was a, a magazine produced uh, weekly out of, out of a tiny little town in Kansas. This is where Debs made a good portion of his income writing for, for uh, The Appeal to Reason. And at, one, at, its, at its high point uh, before the war, there, was a, there, there were 700,000 subscribers to the Appeal to Reason. There was also the, the, the National Ripsaw, published out of St. Louis uh, by another uh, friend of Debs, the Kate Richards O'Hare, with the lovely slogan, we're blind as a bat to all but the right. So it's an enormous press that was, that was pushing this, this position that the socialists had. And they also had charismatic leaders, most notably Eugene Debs, who had campaigned for president four times up to that point since 1900, and had received 6% of the vote in 1912. Debs himself often said 
I'm running for president now, but if the socialists ever get close, I will step aside because I would be a terrible president. You know, I'm a propagandist. I'm a preacher for socialism, not an administrator or a political leader in the, in the conventional sense. But he had enormous success using the, the election cycle as a way to spread the, the socialist uh, gospel. So well before the, the national crisis of the war, mainstream politicians and editors uh, considered Debs to be a, a rising and dangerous force. Teddy Roosevelt called him one of our most undesirable citizens, an apostle of bloodshed and riot. So now Debs uh, and his movement promised to oppose America's war efforts, including the plan to draft millions of men, engage them in the, in the process uh, of war production. So the government, as we, as we said uh, yesterday, uh, responded by launching an unprecedented uh, campaign to stir war passions, and they silenced opposing voices through the Espionage Act. Now that 1917 law that we've been talking about this, this uh, weekend proved ineffective against espionage, but it empowered the government to go after war dissenters. Let me find this. Well, the post office uh, used this to, uh, to ban radical publications from the mails, uh, bankrupting them, and 2,000 radicals and pacifists were put on trial, many of them sentenced to up to 20 years in prison. As we've said, Deb's crime was a, was a speech that he gave late in the war uh, in June 1918 in Canton, Ohio at a socialist picnic. Uh, most of what Deb said uh, that day was the same thing he'd been saying for almost 20 years. Uh, he knew that government agents were in the audience uh, transcribing his every word. He had said at the start of the speech, I, I, can't, I can't say everything I'm thinking, uh, but I'm not going to say anything I don't, I don't believe today. And the audience responded to that and knew just what he was talking about. But he did do two things that caught the attention of the, the, the government prosecutors. First of all, he defended his comrades who were already in prison for violating the Espionage Act. He said, if they're guilty, I'm guilty too. And, and he did say this, the working class who fight all the battles, the working class who make the supreme sacrifices, the working class who freely shed their blood and furnish the corpses have never yet had a voice in either declaring war or making peace. It's the ruling class that invariably does both. You need to know that you're fit for something better than slavery and cannon fodder. And in 1918, such comments were illegal and Debs was arrested. At the trial, the, the government claimed that they had not been denying Debs his, his right to free speech. The prosecutor claimed that Debs was urging young men to avoid the draft and so therefore was inciting others to commit a crime. And inc incitement to illegal activity is a, is a form of speech that's not protected by the First Amendment. As we've seen in court, Debs refused to apologize. He was unrepentant. He admitted that he'd made those remarks, but he claimed that it was actually the Espionage Act that had violated his First Amendment rights and that that's what should be on trial uh, in Cleveland. He also took the chance to make another speech for socialism uh, that we in, in, uh, got to enjoy yesterday. He told the jury that down through history, all social progress comes from a small and courageous minority willing to stand up against the system and demand change. He reminded the jury in that, in that beautiful courtroom that we saw yesterday, if some of us did, uh, that Jefferson had been a revolutionary, that the abolitionists who had been so despised when they began their crusade had also been denied their right to free speech uh, and were now remembered and honored. And he said this, while there is a lower, the working class who fight, let's, no, we're, let's, here we go. I have been accused of, of having obstructed the war. I admit it, gentlemen, I abhor war. I would oppose the war if I stood alone. I believe in patriotism. I have never uttered a word against the flag. I love the flag as a symbol of freedom. I object only when that flag is prostituted to base purposes and sordid ends by those who, in the name of patriotism, would keep the people in subjection. While there is a lower class, I am in it. While there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Now, those eloquent arguments uh, made little impact on the judge and jury. Uh, he was quickly convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. But here's to me where, I mean, this is, a, this is I think, a, a, a crucial and familiar story for us to remind ourselves about. Here's another part of the story that I think is also very interesting. Uh, when Debs went off to prison in the spring of 1919, it was really only a, a small handful of his fellow radicals who were able to raise much of a protest. The, the press itself had been, been uh, decimated at that point. Uh, 
Uh, some of his comrades were still in jail. Many others were out on probation and, and had to be careful. But in the end, Debs only served three years of his 10 years, uh, thanks to a massive protest movement that grew steadily in the months after the war ended. Very few in the broad American public cared about the fate of the foreign radicals, the more anonymous uh, pacifists and labor organizers who had been caught up in the Espionage Act net. But Debs was known around the world, and many people were stunned by the idea that he could be sent to jail. One of our uh, panelists yesterday suggested this would be something like putting Bernie Sanders in jail. You know, that, that here's a person who is extremely visible. You may disagree with his policies, but you have to recognize that he is a sincere and active player in the national conversation. And suddenly, here he is in the Atlanta penitentiary dressed in, in denim in front of the bars. So Americans who really had no interest in socialism uh, gradually came to believe that his imprisonment was a dangerous violation of First Amendment rights for everyone. And they came to this not uh, just through thinking this on their own, but because of a tireless uh, three-year effort called the Amnesty Movement. And this was the first massive free speech protest movement in the nation's history, and I think one of the, one of the great forgotten protest movements in our past. The Amnesty campaign used lots of strategies. It was a diverse movement. Uh, this included a, a postcard campaign to try to agitate uh, lawmakers to, to release the political prisoners, as they called them. Union organizers circulated petitions in order to free the prisoners. Uh, and many unions uh, were conservative on this issue. In fact, considered Debs to be a, a, a rival, to considered his approach to labor organizing and, and to, to, to socialism to be uh, different than particularly the AFL unions. Uh, so many of them considered Debs to, in fact, be a bit of a traitor to his country. Uh, and this amnesty movement brought these petitions to them, made the argument that said, look, if they can put the socialists in jail, the next people they're going to put in jail are, are labor organizers like you, right? And so there, there was an amazing national debate in, in union local halls across the country. Uh, many of these people st struggled with this issue and, and ended up writing petitions. Uh, they're all in the National Archives now, big stacks of them, uh, that, that, that talk about working through these issues and where working people uh, came down on the issue, uh, calling uh, on President Wilson uh, to release Debs. Uh, for for thinking, thinking through this First Amendment questions, really, I think, in a profound way and in some ways for the first time. The Socialist Party uh, gathered hundreds of thousands of signatures on, a, on what they called a monster petition uh, and brought them to a pickup truck on the Capitol, drove up and down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue, cut the petition into pieces and brought each piece up to, to the legislators uh, in order to, to talk to them. The, these are the sorts of people from this era uh, that, that were signing on to this amnesty movement. Just give you a, a small list of some of the people that were, were began to be engaged in this free speech issue, uh, thinking about Debs. That included Helen Keller, Clarence Darrow, H.L. Mencken, Carl Sandburg, Sinclair Lewis, Upton Sinclair, George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, Alice Paul, and Charlotte Perkins Gilman. Kate Richards O'Hare, uh, the socialist who, who uh, was the editor of the Ripsaw that I mentioned in, in St. Louis uh, gathered the children of some of these, what they came to call political prisoners, uh, and marched them to the gates of the White House in order to protest. The best known legacy of this amnesty movement uh, is the development of what came to be the American Civil Liberties Union. This is a small group of, of liberals and radicals who organized initially to help the conscientious objectors who had been imprisoned. And then they, they tr transitioned to work in order to join the fight to press for the release of political prisoners. This was not the first organized uh, free speech league, free speech movement in the country, but it certainly has emerged as, as uh, the most, most visible. And one of the amnesty movement's most successful strategies was to nominate Debs. Uh, for many, this turned the 1920 election into a referendum about the government's attack on free speech. The Wilson administration at that point was saying the 1920 election should be a referendum on the idea of a League of Nations. Uh, but the socialists argued, no, actually, this should be a, a rare opportunity for the public to, to unite and to press against uh, the, the federal overreach of the Espionage Act and other acts during, during the war. And one, close to one million Americans uh, voted for Debs in this 1920 election, even though Debs 
had to spend his entire time uh, in the prison hospital uh, folding laundry and helping prisoners uh, rather than being out on the campaign stump. And when we think that there were only about 10,000 dues-paying socialists at that point and close to one million Americans voted uh, for Debs, we can see that a lot of this amounted to a, a protest for free speech and a defense of Debs that didn't have to do with his politics so much as it did with the wider politics of the importance of free speech. Not everybody sympathized with Debs, of course. Uh, this is a period that we think of as the, the, uh, the first Red Scare, when there was uh, enormous uh, vigilante violence uh, against uh, socialists uh, and against suffragists and against a, a, a number of other uh, radical movements. The American Legion, uh, organizing in this period after the war, lobbied hard to keep Debs locked up. Many returning veterans uh, decided that Debs and others were traitors to the cause. Uh, and they used vigilante violence to wipe out uh, socialism across the country. They broke up amnesty meetings and parades. They smashed printing presses. They even kidnapped some of the socialist speakers, uh, including Kate Richards O'Hare for a time. The Ku Klux Klan, also uh, uh, emergent in the early 20s, the second Klan, uh, also pushed hard to keep Debs in jail uh, and used vigilante violence at time against the radicals. Others made more reasonable arguments against Debs. Uh, this is the New York Times as Debs is going, uh, going off to prison. There's no reason for sympathy with Debs except such as goes to a fighter who asks no odds. His theory amounted simply to the impossible doctrine that he had full liberty to overturn the Constitution, but that the government had no power to stay him. Debs made his fight and he lost it, so the consequences which Debs invited have now fallen on his head. That is all there is of the case. Many legal experts echoed this opinion, and newspaper editors as well. They said free speech is only one value among others, that it's not too much to ask Americans to set aside their criticisms of a government policy while soldiers are risking their lives on the battlefield, and that essentially to offer free speech uh, that would in turn, by their view, overturn the right of free speech by undermining the Constitution uh, made no sense. Debs was a revolutionary. He wanted to destroy American government, so why should the government feel an obligation to protect his rights? And so I hope I can give you a sense there is an enormously lively, fertile debate going on in the country in the aftermath that I think is happening mostly because Debs is in prison and mostly because these amnesty uh, workers in the labor movement, in the socialist movement, uh, and elsewhere in the free speech movement are all gathering to, to press, to push this into the national conversation in a way that it really had never been before. People were thinking this through. Wilson was well aware of this pressure, this mounting pressure. You can see in his files in the National Archive, a huge uh, piles of letters of people writing, many of them saying, I'm no radical, my family came over on the Mayflower, but I'm deeply concerned about what the Wilson administration has done, uh, and I, I want this changed. On his last day of office, many, many uh, liberals and progressives were hoping that Wilson uh, would liberate Debs, would free Debs in order to clear uh, the bitter feelings from this war. But Wilson said that he felt an obligation to the young men who had died on the battlefield, and he refused to pardon. But by 1921, as Republican Warren Harding came into office, public support for amnesty was growing. People had different reasons uh, for supporting the amnesty movement. Some thought it was, had been fine to put Debs in jail during the war, but that, that he ought to be let out once the war was over that 10 years punishment was excessive, keeping him in jail while there was a national emergency was one thing, but let's clear the jails at this point. But others felt that the country had made a, a, a terrible mistake, a wrong turn during the war, that the government had used its power in new and unprecedented ways in order to promote war fever and to silence its critics, and that this was a crucial moment in order to push back against that. And disillusionment with the war quickly set in uh, many Americans began to conclude, as they saw the, the consequences of the Versailles Treaty uh, and the, the failure of Wilson's vision for a League of Nations, that maybe the socialists had been right, maybe Debs had been right, that the war had been fought for profits rather than for democracy. And especially as, as more and more information came out about war profiteering, and you can see a, a political cartoon here where there's a, inevitably these war profiteers have a big belly and a cigar and a, and a watch chain. And clearly Debs is a person who's in prison the real criminal, according to this cartoon, is, is, is outside, riding pretty, while Debs remains in jail. 
Increasing number of people decided that whatever they thought about socialism, then in fact maybe the socialists had been silenced because they had threatened the war effort and because they'd been saying harsh things about the, the, the war profits and the, uh, of big business rather than because they were actually trying to undermine the war effort in, in some other way. So ironically, it's Warren Harding, a conservative Republican who was no friend of socialism, uh, who finally let Debs out of jail on Christmas morning in 1921. And Harding never conceded that the government had been wrong, uh, but he felt that letting Debs out of jail was the right thing to do in order to, to help uh, the nation recover from the, the wounds of war, what he called a return to normalcy. Debs was, uh, uh, one of my favorite parts about doing this research was coming to learn about Debs as a person. And, and one of the most fascinating and touching things, I think, is that everywhere he went, his, his jailers fell in love with him. Uh, and this happened to him when he was in the, at the Pullman strike uh, uh, and, and in jail uh, in Woodstock, Illinois. And his, uh, the, the, the jailer, the warden there, stayed in touch with him for the rest of his life and, and invited him uh, home for uh, holidays and so forth. Debs, likewise, uh, his, his jailer in, in Moundsville Penitentiary, where he was temporarily, uh, uh, used to sneak him out of the prison in order to bring him home to meet his family. Uh, and, and likewise, when he ended up in Atlanta Penitentiary, the warden was quite interested in reform and talked to Debs at great length about how to improve things in the prison. And Debs had some, some real harsh things to say about, about the treatment of prisoners uh, that he ultimately uh, put together in a book uh, called Walls and Bars that he published afterward. But, the warden was really interested and in fact, again, snuck Debs out of prison in order to, to uh, uh, give him a tour of Atlanta and go see their model prison uh, farm and so forth. On Christmas morning, Debs, the reporters are, have a sense this is going to happen. Debs appears out of prison. The, re the reporters are all excited. It turns out Debs is actually heading over for Christmas breakfast with the warden's family uh, and then goes back into prison. But as he's ready to leave, uh, the warden decides to give a present, not just to Debs, but to uh, all the prisoners. Many of them uh, fell in love with Debs in just the same way. He was, he was uh, uh, compassionate. Many of the political prisoners that I, that I covered, uh, uh, learned about in this, considered other prisoners to be sort of parasites in the, in the, the capitalist state. Debs himself saw very clearly that prisons were, were a tool of class warfare and that he could be just as active and, and useful as a socialist uh, in the prison, working with the prisoners. So he wrote letters for them. He counseled them. Uh, he was in the prison hospital and, and watched many of them die of, of drug overdoses uh, and, and related problems, uh, and was really deeply beloved uh, by the prisoners. Uh, many, many people around the world were sending Debs candy and cookies and books and so forth. He kept none of it for himself and spread this out among, among his prisoners. Many of them, along with the wardens, uh, described him as uh, as the most generous, Christ-like person they'd ever met. So as Debs is leaving prison that, that morning, the warden gives them all a Christmas present by allowing the prisoners out of their cells so that they can press up against the bars in the front of the prison, uh, and they give Debs a, a roaring standing ovation that apparently can be heard for, for half a mile away. Debs is, is leaving the prison. He turns, this is the moment where he turns and, and signals back to them, tears uh, streaming down his face, uh, and he later described this as uh, the most touching and, and exciting moment to him of his lo very long uh, political career. This stint in jail, short as it was, less than a uh, little less than three years, uh, damaged Debs' health, which was not good to begin with. Uh, he emerged from prison with his party largely destroyed. Uh, he spent the rest of his life trying to rebuild the Socialist Party. He was still predicting uh, the imminent resurgence of the Socialist Party when he died in 1926. But he had another legacy, aside from his, his deep contribution to, to economic justice, to social justice. I think by going to prison for his beliefs, by standing here in Cleveland and saying, I don't apologize, it's the law itself that should be on trial, and by being the visible prisoner uh, that the amnesty movement centered around, he forced Americans to spend several years arguing about the right of free speech in times of war. The prison cell with Debs in it became a moral high ground, forcing many to reconsider the balance between national security and freedom of speech. And in many ways, it was the birth of a conversation that continues today, the birth of a new concern about free speech rights that shaped American democracy ever since. Now, often when the story is told, as we heard yesterday uh, from Professor McNeil, uh, 
a lot of this has to do with what the Supreme Court thought. And, and, I, and I don't at all uh, dismiss the importance of the evolution of the, of the free speech uh, doctrine uh, that emerges from this, this period with Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, changing his mind. But I think this amnesty story reminds us that free speech is not just what Supreme Court justices say, but it's also what, what we as, as a people say, what we are willing to organize and, and defend. Right? I don't take any credit for that. Deb certainly deserves the credit, and it's been my pleasure to, to uh, uh, watch and think about what he did for us. So thank you.